Historically black colleges and universities, also known as HBCUs, continues to be a critical institution in the black community and very important to SEIC's inclusion and diversity strategy. Hello, I'm Bridget Chapman, Vice President of Inclusion, Diversity, and Corporate Social Responsibility. As we continue to celebrate Black History Month, we are thrilled to share with you a very exciting interview with Dr. Leslie Pollard, President of Oakwood University and editor of the book, Embracing Diversity, How to Understand and Reach People of All Cultures. Also, we'll hear from Davian Burnett, the Director of SEIC Space Development Initiative in our national security and space sector, as well as co-lead of our multicultural resource group. In today's interview, you will hear a very insightful exchange about Oakwood University's history, the importance of collaborating with HBCUs, the Black family, and why inclusion and diversity remains at the forefront of our nation's priorities. Now let's listen in on Davian and Dr. Pollard's discussion. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we are here today to talk about um, how Oakwood University has been working with SEIC for the last 20 years and the impact to the community here at SEIC as well as at the university. Uh, we're fortunate to have the president of the university, Dr. Leslie Pollard, to support this conversation. We'll cover a number of topics. Uh, I'm Davian Burnett from SEIC. I'm the director of the Space Development in Initiative here. And uh, I'd like to have Dr. Pollard introduce himself. Hi, I'm, I'm Leslie Pollard. I'm the 11th president of Oakwood University. Uh, I've been at Oakwood since 2001, so I'm in my 10th year. I came in and I found a rich and productive relationship with SAIC under our former president, Dr. Delbert Baker. And uh, I have continued that to the benefit of the institution and hopefully to the benefit of SAIC. Thank you, Dr. Pollard. Uh, really excited to be here. Uh, let's, let's just get started here. You talked about the relationship that SEIC has had with Oakwood Universe, University. Uh, it's been 20 years. Um, how has this in partnership impacted the awareness of Oakwood and the technology and space industry and your growth as a service provider? Well, well, very, very much, uh, Davey. And let, let me just start with just a few numbers. 150 technology-related internships have come to our students because of this partnership, this mentor-protege partnership with SAIC. Um, we've had at least 12 uh, persons of color employed at NASA as a result of this work. So when I think about measurable impact, I, um, I, I think very, very deeply about the contribution at SAIC and the relationship with SAIC has contributed to the advancement of the university's academic initiatives. That's really interesting. The, the, the numbers, I think, matter, right? So when I think about impact, um, there's, there's people, but what's the positive impact technology has brought to the HBCU community? Oh my, well, that, that's just, I mean, there are too many ways to mention it, but of course, here, here are just a few of them. Um, first of all, because of our technologies, uh, because of our connection to technology, we've been able to make the transition to online education during the pandemic. That's a great example of what technology has enabled the university to do. Um, it's enabled us to provide, um, to provide our education in a, in a variety of modalities, both hybrid, on ground, in classroom, Flex, we've got all kinds of names for it, but, but the point is that the modality through which the delivery of the education has taken place has been mediated because of our technology platforms. Um, the fact that we have engaged technology in such a deep way at the university has enabled us also to facilitate the arrival on our campus of the Alabama School for Cyber Technology and Engineering, which is a, a nine through 12 school that we are housing for the next couple of years because the state of Alabama recognizes how important it is to be able to create a proliferation of, uh, of young scientists, of young techno slash scientists who can go out and work into the workforce. Um, we've been working with technology recently in our Center for Entrepreneurship, 
in which, again, so much of what's being mediated in terms of business engagements is because of, um, is because of the basis of technology that we have in the HBCU community. I could go on and on. I could talk about uh, certifications that we are doing, uh, some with IBM, some with, uh, with, within SAIC. I, SAIC has, a, has its own, I'm saying this quote, academy. Um, Microsoft certifications, computer automated design, a number of different examples give us opportunities to, uh, to, to use technology to advance the institution. And then I think the probably one of the biggest ways technology has impacted HBCUs, um, the very personal mentoring and the very personal relationships, Davian, that define HBCUs. We've been able to automate some of the elements um, uh, of the matriculation process so that students, there will be more time, because I think that's one of the benefits of technology in higher education. It really allows more time for the institution to engage in its core business, which is the, the, the process of equipping, um, shaping, and then deploying students um, into their, their service callings. So th those are just some of the ways, and I could mention many, many others, but those are some of the ways in which technology has impacted HBCUs. That's a really good rundown. Uh, I like the, let's call it positive impact view of it. Uh, one of the things that we do over here is we always look at the whole picture uh, as part of our company. Uh, has there been any challenges that you faced or see in the HBCU community related to technology? Yeah, probably two of them. Um, as I think at one time when the early, early days of fax machines, remember, I'm not so talking fax machines, so uh, Bruce, my dear friend, will, will remember that some of the early emergence of some of these early office technologies. I remember the then chairperson of Hewlett Packard saying, faxing is wonderful, but you can't fax a handshake. Right. So recognizing the limitations of technology is what the, the then CEO was trying to get us to, that there were some limitations. And one of the challenges of technology is that um, while it enables a certain amount of efficiency within the institutional environment of a high of an HBCU, it also creates a kind of distance because so much can be done, so much more, so many technical things can be done so much more efficiently. And so one of the challenges of, of, of technology in HBCUs is maintaining that mentoring relationship for which HBCUs are so well known. A second challenge is the issue of funding. So for HBCUs, especially the, the group that I belong to, which are the privates, not the states, so when we talk about HBCUs, we need to talk about them in two categories, Davian. One is that there are private HBCUs that are self-funded. Most of these are tuition driven, and I could give you a list of those names. And then we've got another group of HBCUs who are actually state HBCUs who receive their funding from legislatures. On the private side of the HBCU conversation, sufficient funding to keep up with all the technology advances, and of course, we, we, we want to get to a level, we want to have a level of technology deployment and utilization within our institution that keeps us adequate and functional. We know that we can never chase all of the newest um, shiny objects out there in terms of technology, but, but the funding to stay with the things that will keep us competitive and maximally efficient and then um, functional in order to deliver our product with the greatest of ease without spitting dollars right, after every right. new thing that comes out there. So very those good, two, those two, those are the two challenges that I see. Yeah, I like that rundown. Um, I think, you know, technology is easy, easy to talk about because there's so much change, like you said, it's dynamic. Uh, but I wanted to switch gears for a second and talk a little bit about what the president declared this year as a national theme for Black History Month. It's Black families, representation, identity, and diversity. Uh, what opportunities have you seen for Black families to attend universities? And what are some early effective strategies for improving the opportunities for future students? Okay, okay, so, so one of, and, and of course we're thankful for that emphasis from the president uh, on the Black family and especially across the diaspora. So we've seen tremendous opportunities to engage 
the so so multiple so but we we you know never ask a college president one question because he's always got two or three different points right so 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 here's point one of that whole question um, as we think about representation and and black families it's it never has the work never has the need for work on behalf of the masses of black families in America been more critical than it is right now because we we're a nation that can't afford to leave any talent behind. And there is so much resident talent in so many spaces and in so many places that we need to find ways to build bridges through our HBCUs, through the partnerships with organizations like SAIC that would begin to expose a whole generation to careers in technology. So some of you will remember this from a long time ago, but when the Cosby show first came out, so many of our children in urban neighborhoods called the Cosbys. Now, all due respect to all my dear friends who are on the call right, right, right now. They called the Cosbys white people because they had, they said, we've never, we don't know any black people. I'm talking about the Cosbys in the uh, television show, the television family Cosbys. We don't know any black people like that. Okay. So one of the things we have to do in terms of the representation side of the black family, and SAIC can help us do this and has helped us do this, is to show the array of people who are out there doing things who actually look like these young people that we're trying to reach. So when they see a Davian Burnett, they say, oh, I can be an engineer too. Math can be cool, right? All of those kinds of things. Now, across the, beyond the United States and into the diaspora, then one of the ways we are using our technology and one of the ways we're using our connections is through actually affinity engagements so that we reach out to particular communities within the diaspora. So recently we reached out to the Rwandan community and in one year's effort, we were able to attract to our institution more than 60 Rwandan students who are on our campus. And these are Rwandans who are living in the United States. This is a tremendous but invisible talent pool that HBCUs and, and organizations like SAIC can partner together to make sure that we reach the students, these families, with the kinds of outcomes and opportunities that a global company like SAIC actually represents. I hope I answered your question. Did, do, do, you want, do, you want, do you want part three? Because I'll give you part three too, but, I mean, but, but, but yes. I, I think I'll get a little bit later because I think where you were where you're going in part three is kind of related to what we're going to kind of get into next. <clears throat> From a personal standpoint, uh, when you look at your family experience growing up, right? So you're talking about what did you see growing up? Uh, you referenced the Cosby show for you know, a certain generation. Uh, what did you see growing up and, and how does that compare to today in terms of family experiences that you've observed from your students? OK, so what so the first part of your question is, what did I see? Interestingly, I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana at Charity Hospital, which no longer exists now due to Katrina back in 2005. You recall that hospital where the people were drowning? Well, I was born in that hospital back back in the days of Katrina. I know that's that's 15, 16 years ago. Um, so when I grew up, I grew up in a working class neighborhood, uh, wonderful people um, who worked hard every single day. Uh, a part of my life, this is Black History Month, part of my life was spent actually in the segregated South. I remember as a little boy, the colored and the white fountains. I remember all of those things. Um, and I remember the people, though, who were hardworking and fighting back, notwithstanding that kind of thing. I was among those students who were in the first uh, the first group of students to actually be bused from our small neighborhood school over across town in the interest of integration. And that was an interesting experience one day. That, that's a different interview, Davian, about the impact of that experience on so many children. However, there were some services that came through our neighborhood, this neighborhood of working class families. And by the way, most of these families were intact families. They were husbands and wives and in the homes and all. something has happened since then. But back then, um, I was in a single parent home, but I was in the minority, the distinct minority. The majority of those homes were two parent families, et cetera. So something has happened. We need to explore that. But one of the things that was a lifesaver for me that during the summers, along with 
playing football and baseball and all those things and fall football and summer baseball and all those little league things that were great creative outlets. The city launched a mobile library, a mobile library that came to our neighborhood and we used to call it the bookmobile. And any student could pick out 10 books and, and read them across that summer. And I, every year I did that for like four or five years and I would read those books. And even though I was down in that little working class neighborhood in New Orleans, Louisiana, Davian, when I opened those books, I could go to Paris. I could go to, you know, back then, Czechoslovakia. I remember one of the cities was, one of the countries was Czechoslovakia. Czech Republic. Yeah. Yeah. Now the, now the Czech Republic, it was Czechoslovakia back then. Right, and, right. Um, and, and I remember that. I remember reading about the war. I took an interest in the Jewish Holocaust. I remember reading about... Uh, the Jews in Germany and all, and and reading became for me um, an avenue of imagination to be able to go out and to go beyond my small environment. So that's what I saw. And I had a mother who, though she was a janitor, she encouraged reading because she was a great reader and had a prolific library. <clears throat> So that's what I saw growing up, and that continued to shape me, and little did I know that that would be a part of the preparation of my life to be able to serve the lives of other young people who may have had similar backgrounds. Um, that's what I saw. Now when I think about what we are doing um, today, what we are doing today and some of the challenges that families are facing, I think a lot of it has to do, and I'll circle back to that word, it has to do with exposure, with relationship, and with opportunity. And, and, and part of what SAIC, I believe, is doing for us and doing with us is making sure that every sector of our society has an ample opportunity to be exposed to what the world of science and what the world of technology and what the world of engineering, and I could go all down all the things that you do, what these things actually can mean in the life of a family. We have the ability through our partnership with, with, um, with SAIC to actually change the trajectory of families for generations just based upon the choices of a few members of those families. I hope that kind of gets to maybe what you're feeling for in your question. No, I, I appreciate the arc that you took with that description. Um, I, I understand exactly both my family Parents are from the deep south and seeing the colored water fountains at a young age was impactful um, and kind of where we are today and seeing what's available is, is a very powerful story. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, in terms of kind of how you get to uh, get through your life uh, with all that as background, um, you cite personal values, uh, integrity, spirituality, humility, equity, compassion, excellence and collaboration. Um, I think we probably could get a story for each of those words from you. Um, but, you know, when you look at that list and your core values and how you operate, uh, which of those values do you struggle the most with? Well, the one that I struggle with the most is the one that I work on the most, and that's the one of collaboration. Um, I, I think, Davian, every industry has its own history and culture and cultures. Okay. So a part of the history, a part of the history of higher education, and there's a reason it's been around for more than, you know, 1,200 years, right? Very little changes <laughs> in higher education. So higher education is constantly in a chase to be in dialogue with employers like you all to say, okay, what should we be working on? What is it that your workforce needs? How should we be responding to that? So a, so, so a part of the challenge that I face, uh, that I struggle with the most, even though it's one that I, I, I work on all the time, is actually collaboration. Now, many people on campus, may, maybe my CFO would be surprised to hear me say that, but th the reason I work on that one is because collaboration, while it seemed, while it appears to extend the time of discussion on the front end, we know from a management perspective that it actually shortens the implementation on the back end, right? So people call that all kinds of things, getting ownership, getting buy-in, calling it whatever, whatever, whatever. Sometimes the pressures of higher education can push us to make decisions that are unilateral, if that's probably too strong a word, but us isolated, 
isolate. Right, now, maybe right. you can't do that in the space industry and in SAIC because it doesn't work. You need the other scientists with you. But there are times when, as president of the institution, barring emergency and crises, that I can actually make a decision that I don't have to speak to anybody about. But, but every time I make a decision, I'm always assessing the impact, the impact upon our system, the impact upon our processes, the impact upon our policies, and the impact upon our personnel. So the one that I work on the most, whether I struggle with it or not, I, I don't know, but the one that I try to work on the most is the one of collaboration, because that's the one that gets an, organ, an institution, an educational institution, the farthest the fastest, although sometimes it feels counterintuitive, but right, it does right. get us the farthest, the fastest. Very good. Thank you um, for kind of that rundown on that. Um, we look at you here in this interview and you give us, you know, some of your background and you tell us a little bit about, you know, how you operate today. Uh, SEIC as a company, you know, continues to grow and mature and uh, we've recently released a set of company values. Um, so our words are passion, empowerment, integrity, inclusion, and innovation. Um, which of these resonates the most with you? Um, I think for, for your company, I think the one that resonates the most with me is inclusion. That's the one we've lived with, with your, with your company. That the investment in inclusion, and I want to say this because I've had a job like the diversity and inclusion job. I had it at another system where it wasn't as big as yours. You've got, I don't know, how many how many employees does SAIC have? I think the number we're using right now is 27,000. Uh, 27,000. Wow. Wow. Okay. So my organization wasn't as big as yours. It had 17,000 employees. Um, but we, we, and I had the job of diversity and inclusion. Um, the, the, the power of that, I think inclusion is the one where once we set the outcomes and set the targets, it's where we make the investment. And the people who do this work actually need the organization to invest in this work. It doesn't come by kumbaya. It doesn't come, um, I'm going to use a word from higher education. It doesn't come in an extracurricular way. Because every time an employee like you or Bridget take on this, or Bruce even, you take on this duty for a diversity and inclusion, you're actually adding to your portfolio. And so, it, so this, this work that you are doing, it, it actually does need some funding and some investment in order to make it flourish. So I think inclusion and, I would say, inclusion for your company, inclusion and, of course, what we have seen is the accompanying investment in inclusion, because it's not going to happen magically, right? When, when you, I think you you work in the space industry, yeah. and when we're developing those those beautiful things that we're seeing right now, I mean, on Mars, I was watching the the pictures from Mars last evening, yes. and I and yes. I think of all the work it took. That that was an investment, and we would never leave something so important. We would never leave it to incidental funding. We can't. The same is true with diversity and inclusion. It really takes very intentional funding and investment, and that's what I think SAIC is attempting to do. I don't want to overspeak because I'm not, I'm not on the inside of your company. I'm on the outside looking in. But right. but from what I've seen the past few years under Bruce's leadership and Dan, even before him, and, and you know, um, I have seen an investment, and 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 sometimes you get. It takes a little while before you begin seeing the return on that investment. But if, if you get certain number, certain quality of employees because of your investment in diversity and inclusion, you might have the person who can actually change the world that you're hiring, right? So, so that's where the imagination comes in. Okay. Well, hopefully it's not imagination, and that's actually what we'll accomplish, right? And uh, as part of our, our, our goals as a company. Um, you talked about collaboration as something that you work on the most. Um, you know, for us, could you give us some insight in terms of, you know, what unique collaborations exist within HBCUs that you, you know, maybe wouldn't see in other groups of universities? 
Okay, so many times you see um, intra-institutional collaborations, right? Intra-institutional collaborations. So uh, most recently, because of the, the uh, a grant offered by the Lilly Foundation, um, three of our institutions were able to form a collaboration, and we called it the TOT cluster because of the, the first, that's an acronym, Talladega, Oakwood University, and Tougaloo University. And together, we were able to work on a, a very specific, a very specific approach to curriculum called a career pathways based approach in which we looked at three different elements of a student's experience from the time we recruit them until the time that they are placed in professions. We looked at the curricular approach. We looked at the co-curricular elements that contribute to a student's matriculation. And then we looked at the guided pathways that, that is the advising processes that will get a student to the next level. That's where SAIC comes in. That's where mentoring and all those exposures and internships, <clears throat> that's where all of those items come in. So we were able to form this partnership. We have done it now for about four years. And coming out of this, we've been able to refine some of our processes to provide the kind of guided pathway help that students will need to choose careers. We've been able to create an Oakwood app, which brings to the fingertips of the student all of the essential access to all of the essential information services a student needs to be empowered to matriculate through the university. So that's been a wonderful experience. And again, it's a great example of smaller institutions coming together, Oakwood with its approximately 1,500 students, Tougaloo with its six or 700, Talladega with its seven to 800, all coming together and saying, look, in terms of economy, economies of scale, we probably can accomplish more together than we could independently. So, so that's a good example, and that is current as we speak. Very good. I, I like the idea of teams. Uh, we build those all day, every day around here. So. Uh, I resonate with what you're saying here. Um, as you talk about Oakwood University, uh, obviously you all have accomplishments. You've touched on those throughout this interview. Um, in 2020, 2020, we were recognized, you were recognized with the U.S. Department of Treasury for sterile leadership. Oakwood University has many accomplishments. Uh, you've talked to some of those accomplishments through this interview. Um, when you look at 2020, you were recognized as the U.S. Department of Treasury for stellar leadership. Has that opened new frontiers or opportunities for you as an HBCU? Absolutely. The um, I think about some of the awards that, and the attention that has been brought uh, to this area. I think of the hard work of my CFO, Miss um, Sabrina Cotton, who oversees our whole contracting operation. Um, and I think of some of the things that, that, that there have been a number of awards related to some of these things, like the Nunn Perry Award for Excellence uh, in the Department of Defense, uh, the Mentor-Protege Program. That was an outstanding award. Um, another, we've, we've, of course, earned and earned and been awarded of ISO certification um, as one of the few, if not the only at this point that I know of, uh, HBCUs to earn that kind of ISO 9001-2015 certification. And this has enabled us to collaborate with companies, including 12 subcontracts, and the university is also a prime contractor with the state of Alabama. Um, so I, I think of these kinds of awards and the leveraging that they give us, the platform that they give us for when we are trying to advance the careers and the service of uh, and our service to our students by making sure that these kinds of partnerships provide us the funding we need to keep them matriculating and to keep their experience rich and meaningful. Very good. Well, I have one more question, Dr. Pollard. Um, you, you've got a book out there entitled Embracing Diversity, How to Reach People of All Cultures. Uh, it, there's interviews there. There's uh, some of your experience there and teachings around leadership and cultural competence. Um, one of the things that I'd like you to kind of put a little bit of uh, detail around is what you define as cultural competence. How do you achieve it? And then is there anything else that uh, is kind of embedded in those stories and interviews that you would want people to take away as a key message uh, from your book? 
Okay, so I'll try to keep my answer short, Davian, because I could talk about this. That could have been the whole interview, just that <laughs> question. So, but I'm going to keep it short. So when we talk about cultural competence and leadership, what we're actually talking about is the ability of leaders to see the world through others' eyes, to build those connections, and then to move those connections forward in a way that accomplishes the leadership objectives of an organization, right? So right, now, right. now when you say that, People say, well, and you know, I worked in healthcare. I told you about these 17,000 employees. So I would do this with a physician, and a physician would say to me sometimes, say, Doc, that's great. You know, physician, kind of hardcore scientists, some of the hardcore scientists at a school of medicine. They say, but Doc, the flu is the flu. I said, yeah, but the person who has the flu is different. <laughs> Every right, person right. who has the flu is different. And so part of, yes, you got to treat the flu, but they're not robots. So your, tr your goal in cultural competence as a physician is to really win increased compliance with the care plan. And how do you do that? You learn to see the world through the eyes of the other. How do they understand what it means to have the flu? How do you, how do you know they don't believe that the flu is evidence of demon possession? How do you know that? Until you enter into their world and then it doesn't mean that you change your science. It means that you adapt your science. So cultural competence requires a certain amount of adaptability. We learn in higher education that you don't recruit every student the same way. There are some cultural communities where you go through the family to get to the student. There are other cultural communities where you go through the student to get to the family. So cultural competence says, I want, now, someone could say, well, recruiting is recruiting. No, it's not, because someone has to respond to your recruitment. So when I think about cultural competence in your field, how do you get young people of color to say that science matters, that science is cool, that science is not dorky, it's not geeky, it's not... How do you get them to say that? Well, you figure out what they actually value. So maybe... The way, you teach, the way you teach geometry is by taking them to the basketball court and showing them the various angles that enhance a basketball player's. What is, what is Phil Jackson's triangle offense? Well, first of all, you got to understand what a triangle is, right? right I mean, right. he was famous for it. Tex Winter created it. I like sports. Tex Winter created it, but Phil Jackson popularized it with the Lakers. So how does a triangle actually work? And you, you begin to use things within the world of the student in order to get them to see the value of what you're actually trying to get them to do. OK, so so cultural competence is something I could talk about forever. So what does it what does cultural competence mean? It means that leaders begin to think about reaching people with their message in ways that increase its hearability and its receptivity. That's cultural competence. Now, on what is it designed to achieve? It's designed to achieve maximum outputs for the organization, right? Maximum output. Look at SAIC. I probably can go back in SAIC's history and remember a time when they blew right by History Month, Black History Month. I probably wouldn't have to search back too far. SAIC has been around, I don't know, how many years? How many years? How many? Decades. Decades. In decades. Very okay. Far, decades. Far. So, <laughs> so in the very yeah. So in the very first decades, I'm sure that there were times they blew right by Black History Month. Like, oh, it's February. Oh, okay. So when and what are we doing in March? Right. Let's plan for March. Right. But now, when you think about it, the very fact that we're having this conversation is an evidence of a commitment to cultural competency because you have employees for whom this to overlook this month is very would would set the organization back. To overlook this month would set the organization back, and to maximize this month will educate the organization. I think that's why we're doing this today. That's, again, evidence of the impact of cultural competency. I hope I answered your question. You did. Um, I think there's maybe one last thing I'll ask you. Um, you know, if, if you want to leave the organization with uh, any key message or any thought, um, for them to think about as they kind of finish out Black History Month and get through 2021 with everything that, you know, we're experiencing right now. 
Well, I think I think for SAIC, what I would say is, first of all, I would say thank you. I would say thank you for the partnership that we've enjoyed for more than 20 years. That's what I would say. I would say I, I would thank people like Bruce and I would thank people like Dan. I would thank all of the leaders. You know, whenever you start calling names, you know, you get in trouble. Um, but I, I would thank SAIC for its commitment. I, I really would. And, and, and it's been a bold commitment. I would say let's study ways to expand that. Let's study ways to increase our reach. Let's study ways to step earlier into the pipeline and to partner with institutions that can actually assist us. Um, one of my dreams has been to have a, a, a kind of an SAIC-based school or program of engineering on the Oakwood University campus. But we would need the partnership of SAIC to make something like that happen. And, and many HBCUs, as I think about it, we, we have the personnel, we have the passion. What we often don't have are the resources to make that kind of thing happen. So when we enter into partnerships, then that's what we would look for. We would look for SAIC to be a leader in the industry, as you are trying to be right now. I can sense that. To, to, so people say, you want to see how this whole inclusion thing works? Look at what SAIC is doing. Look at what it's doing with HBCUs. Look at what it's doing in the communities where it has offices, where it has corporate. What is it doing in those communities? Um, and, and, and help and, 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 and recognize that not everybody who's just concerned about, you know, the physics of, you know, a flight is going to be with you because often they may not see it. But, but there has to be visionaries. There have to be, have to be visionaries who actually see the potential of these kinds of relationships and then has the courage and the boldness and the persuasiveness to make those relationships happen so that the institution will be blessed and will be benefited. So, so that SAIC will grow and deliver on its outcomes and continue to be a global company. So that, that's what I would say. I would want SAIC to continue its commitment and to figure out ways to expand that commitment and let us come alongside you and help you with that. Thank you, Dr. Pollard. I know your time is uh, always of the essence. I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today, to educate us today and uh, spend your time uh, working through some of the things that we talk about internally here and how we can work together uh, going forward with Oakwood University. I, I applaud you and I ask that you continue to impact these young people every day. It's important and we will do what we can here to uh, manage our commitment to you all and, and, and work forward as we go into the years to come. So thank you for your time. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Yesterday, a man said to me, he said, how can you smile when your world is crumbling down? I said, here's my secret. Just be strong, keep the faith, lift your head and hold on, change is coming, hold on, don't you worry about a thing, hold on, for you can make it, hold on, oh, cause everything will be alright, hold on, your change is coming. Hold on, don't worry about a thing, hold on, for you can make it, hold on, for everything will be all.